Hello, this is John Tolbert. I'm a lead analyst at Cooping & Coal. Today we'll be talking about consumer identity and access management and the relationship with big data and the Internet of Things. And the other presenter today is Cedric Viedman from Vitas ID, Vitas Concepts. So let's get started. So about us, Cooping & Coal, we were founded in 2004. We're an independent analyst organization. We offer neutral advice on identity management, cybersecurity, and a variety of other topics you see down below. Uh, we support both end user organizations uh, as well as software vendors and uh, different kinds of system integrators, again, with uh, topics such as information security, identity and access management, identity governance, GRC, and really anything around the digital transformation topic. We have three major business areas, uh, research. We do research on all those different fields. We stay vendor neutral. We try to keep up to date so that we can offer the best independent advice in industry. Uh, we do events uh, such as webinars like this, conferences, other kinds of special events. Uh, we provide uh, leadership summits. And we these events provide really good opportunities for networking and then to be able to meet the experts in the field. And we also do advisory work. And by these, I mean short-term consulting engagements where we may help out end user organizations with things such as uh, RFP shortlisting or in cases of software vendors, we help them develop their product and service roadmaps. So on the event side, we have several events upcoming. Um, the next up is our Consumer Identity World event tour. Uh, it's all about consumer identity topics like that we're going to talk about today. Uh, it's starting next week in Seattle. Uh, and then at the end of October, we will be in Amsterdam and the end of November in Singapore. And Vitas Concepts is a sponsor of some of the Consumer Identity World events. And for that, we're thankful. Then we also have the Cybersecurity Leadership Summit coming up in November in Berlin, uh, running at the same time as the Cyber Access Summit. So please check out these events and we hope to see you there. So about the webinar, uh, everyone's muted centrally. You don't have to mute or unmute yourself. We will unmute and take questions at the end. The webinar is being recorded. Uh, and there is a questions uh, blank in the webinar application. So at any time you have questions, feel free to put those questions in the blank and we will address them at the end. So I'll start off and talk about the differences between traditional identity management solutions and consumer identity management and the market trends and the business drivers. And then Cedric will take over and talk about their solution and we will save the Q&A for the end. So I thought it would be good to start with, you know, let's look at the differences between traditional IAM and consumer identity. So traditional IAM systems have been around for going on close to 20 years, uh, and they really were designed to be employee facing, hence the difference in customer or consumer facing identity management systems, and that really drives all the functional differences that you see below uh, for uh, traditional identity management. Uh, obviously, we've, we've had passwords for a long time, LDAP passwords, uh, but other authentication methods that are, have been supported for quite a while are things like Kerberos, smart cards, or other kinds of hardware tokens. Contrast that with consumer identity systems that still rely predominantly on username and password but also increasingly social logins from social networks such as Facebook, Google, Twitter, and then also mobile applications uh, for login and sometimes the mobile biometrics that come with, uh, with mobile phones. The attributes that are collected uh, for traditional identity management systems are used for authorization. Think about group membership and who should be able to see what kinds of documents or data Whereas in consumer identity management systems, attributes are collected for know your customer purposes. And by this, I mean more than just uh, KYC for financial purposes. It's to get to know your customers so that you can better serve them. 
data about uh, employees is usually stored in LDAP, sometimes SQL databases. Uh, it's always structured data. On the consumer side, there's an opportunity to do that and more. There's LDAP and SQL, but also NoSQL kinds of databases so that you can store unstructured data as well. Increasingly, we see, you know, let's say, social uh, retail media companies that are interested in storing things like audio and video for their consumers also. For single sign-on, many times in traditional identity management solutions, SAML federation is used. But on the consumer side, it's much more common to run into OAuth or OpenID Connect. And then some of the driving concerns for identity management in traditional or enterprise IAM is really about access control. Like I was saying, group membership, determining who can get to what data. And on the consumer side, it's about privacy, uh, being able to collect consent, knowing what information can be shared with other partners. So diving a little bit farther down on enterprise IAM, we see we've got employees on the inside, customers are on the outside. It can be difficult to capture the rich profile data that consumer facing companies want by using traditional or enterprise IAM systems. Salespeople often have to manually enter data about their customers into separate CRM systems. And there's usually less flexible authentication options, uh, which also can lead to more inefficient marketing processes when you take all these factors in combination. Enterprise IAM has scaled very well uh, to even up to the hundreds of thousands. Many large companies have hundreds of thousands of employees or contractors, and uh, you know those systems have been around for many years, and, and they do well at authenticating and doing complex authorization for up to hundreds of thousands of employees. But they do tend to have difficulties going beyond that. And as we'll see with consumer IAM, uh, there's often a need to scale to the many millions or in some cases even billions of users. So other ways in which consumer identity management solutions differ from enterprise IAM solutions is you have human resources on the employee facing side that collect information about employees at the time they're hired and then populate all that information uh, in the database. On the consumer side, it's more consumer driven. So you need to be able to allow consumers to register themselves, use those social logins, existing OIDC uh, accounts. And you don't collect all the information about them up front. This is where the idea of progressive profiling comes from. You take information as users offer it so that you don't uh, hit them up front with lots and lots of questions about their preferences or even what they want to consent to. Then you can collect data as time goes on, uh, what they may purchase, maybe their social media likes, and then you can store this data again with consent properly in place. This can lead to a much better 360 degree view of the customer and the things to which they have consented. So in this way, you see more of a direct integration between your CIM solution to customer relationship management solutions and then marketing and marketing automation. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So the notion of BYOD has been around for a while, and that's users bringing their own device. Obviously, with consumer-facing solutions, companies really don't have any control over the kinds of devices that users want to bring to the interaction. But this also leads to the notion of bring your own identity. And in many cases now, identity can be also tied to those devices. And we'll dive into the IoT side of that in a bit as well. And then consumers also expect what we call an omni-channel experience. And by that, we mean having a very similar experience uh, regardless of what kind of platform they originate from, whether it be a desktop, laptop, tablet, uh, mobile phone, or even those IoT devices. Some of the key features we find in consumer identity and access management solutions, uh, we'll go into that here now. So we let's look at the user experience factor. 
so again, registration, it's important to have a self-service portal. And by this, I would think of like a user dashboard where the user can you know, track all the different uses of their information, what attributes they've decided to share, what social networks or other open ID uh, accounts they've linked to, the, uh, the identity that you've created for them. Uh, and then also bulk provisioning can be a factor. If you have an existing identity management solution for your customers, you probably want to be able to import that. Uh, LDAP and, and the SCIM protocol can be useful for that. Authentication, um, username, password, still the most prevalent, uh, but many companies offer social logins, uh, some mobile applications, including mobile biometrics, the, the native uh, Apple and Samsung biometrics, such as Touch ID or Face ID. And there's a real emphasis on customer experience so that you don't really know what brand of CIM solution your customers are using because you can white label it. You can integrate it into your brand and provide single sign-on across multiple web properties and then give you that consent management that's necessary for GDPR and other privacy regulations around the world. Security and privacy are important both from the administrative side as well as uh, the user expectation. Um, users know that passwords and compromised passwords are increasingly the source of most data breaches. So fraud detection is really important. And being able to understand user behavior, profile that behavior, compare current requests to past interactions is uh, an important feature that many consumer identity solutions provide today. They also allow, allow for uh, integrating third-party fraud, compromised credential, and other kinds of threat intelligence services. And think of this as like being able to do an API lookup against, say, the Have I Been Pwned service to see if credentials have been used fraudulently elsewhere and then be able to make a decision whether or not you want to allow those credentials used in your system. Privacy management um, with GDPR in effect now, it's really important to have fine-grained consent mechanisms. And by this we mean being able to offer to the user the ability to say what each bit of data can be used for for each purpose. And then also allow the users to edit or export that data on request and even delete that customer profile data in its entirety. On the back-end security side, we like to evaluate how strong is the administrative security. Does it integrate with other systems like SIM, security incident and event monitoring? And does it offer strong authentication and authorization methods for consumers if appropriate? Many companies are interested in CIM solutions for the marketing and the ability to increase sales revenue. So all the different kinds of data that we've been talking about that we can collect from end users with their consent, um, there's a couple of different ways we like to parse that. So we look at identity analytics. This is more purely about you know, the use of credentials for logins, maybe failed logins, uh, where are they coming from, how many profile edits that they've done. This kind of information can be useful from a security context, uh, more so probably than marketing, but it's really important to be able to prevent fraud. Then on the marketing analytics side, um, many CIM solutions have a lot of built-in marketing analytics capabilities, and they might be able to parse data according to things like age, gender, income, social media activities, um, and then you know transform that information into really good reports. There's two major approaches here, and we see a little divergence in the market where companies are, uh, CIM companies will either provide this natively or open it up to APIs so that you can use your own big data solutions. And then marketing automation, being able to use those native APIs or maybe have some sort of out of the box ready connector to marketing automation solutions like MailChimp or Marketo. IoT, uh, very important, smart home devices. There are three different levels that 
uh, CIM solutions can take with uh, integrating IoT devices. The most basic is password synchronization, just being able to synchronize your passwords and connect it to your digital identity. Um, slightly more sophisticated than that is, you know, an association capability. CIM solutions might be able to register uh, in a non-standard way and track assets in LDAP, SQL, or even sometimes NoSQL databases. The state of the art today is to use the IETF OAuth 2 device flow standard. It's a, a standard for registering and managing IoT devices such as smart home devices and in conjunction with um, consumer identity and management solutions. Not surprisingly, let's look at consumer attitudes towards CIM. Not surprisingly, no one really wants to use passwords. More than half of users will avoid registering to a site if it, they make you come up with yet another user ID and password. Uh, biometrics are certainly not a panacea, but users do want to use them. Uh, Touch ID, Face ID, Samsung biometrics. Um, social logins are uh, make it easier for users to register and, and most almost half will use them. And everybody really is concerned about data privacy with the uh, never-ending string of news stories about data breaches. CIM itself is still the fastest growing segment in IAM with an estimated market size of around 21 billion euros by 2021. There are three major kind of vendors in the market. We've got specialized consumer identity management vendors. Enterprise IAM that we've been describing has been moving toward CIM for the last few years. And now we have identity API platform providers that can sort of serve as a broker between um, identity, existing identity stores and line of business applications. And this has all come about really because digital transformation demands CIM solutions. And we're starting to see some divergence in the products and services that are out there in the CIM solution environment where the kinds of markets that CIM vendors are going after really help determine the features that they build into it. For example, let's say you're a consumer identity solution vendor and you really want to focus on the financial market. It's important to offer multi-factor authentication, strong authentication, uh, and strong risk analytics as well. It may be less important to integrate that with say social logins or to want to do advanced marketing analytics. So companies are beginning to specialize in the kinds of markets and again that really drives the features that we see in the CIM solutions out there. We've been hinting about GDPR. It really is a market driver for CIM because it can start by requiring opt-in rather than uh, opt-out. And you can store the history of consent and allow users to change the, their consent as their own preferences change. You can use CIM solutions to notify users of, let's say, changes to the terms of service. And then many also now have the ability to export their customer data and take it to a different solution provider if they like, and then delete upon request is uh, a requirement for GDPR as well. PSD2 can be a market driver for CIM also. PSD2 defines strong customer authentication um, and it requires strong customer authentication and transactional risk analysis to mitigate against the need for a strong customer authentication event with every transaction. It can also help with to know your customer, this time thinking about it from a purely financial perspective and then also help with compliance with anti-money laundering regulations around the world. And we think CIM will help banks uh, gain a competitive advantage um, in retaining customers. So um, winding down here on my side, consumer identity solutions really can help turn your anonymous users into known customers and then be able to provide better service for them and give them a better user experience. And then I think just as important as that with the regulatory environment that we have today, uh, CIM can help with the 
regulatory compliance, specifically on consent management for GDPR or other privacy regulations around the world, as well as financial regulations like PSD2. So with that, we will turn it over to Cedric. Hi. Um, thank you, John, for the um, introduction and the great input regarding concept management, the comparison between IAM and CIM, as well as the changes and the um, upcoming features requirements here. Um, it was really great to have your presentation here. Um, as already mentioned in the beginning, my name is Cedric. Um, I'm responsible for CDAS as a chief product officer. And I'm really happy to have the chance to show how big data and IoT change um, custom identity and access management today and in the future, and how we already utilize it in CDAS. I would like to start with a fundamental statement here. So um, IoT erodes the identity of the end user. So I think all of you know IoT is not far away. So today I, for example, um, already carry multiple devices with me, um, laptop, smartphone, Apple Watch, a tablet, at home I have even a smart TV, so a bunch of devices here. Um, that leads us to the topic of the webinar. So how do big data and IoT change the customer identity and access management? How does it change the customer engagement, the customer communication, and in particular, the customer behavior here. Um, I would like to start with a short um, and simple example here. So how devices take over new tasks in the context of shopping. So um, suppose you are in a store, there you will be in touch with a salesperson in the personal touch point, but we also have many virtual touch points via mobile devices. We all do online shopping already. And now the device, so the IoT devices in our smart home environment, but also in industry, um, will become a touch point too. If we go deeper into the personal touch point, we have a trained salesperson with a personalized and targeted consultation. So starting from basic information like age and gender, um, to more context specific information like facial expression, gestures or mood. Um, and then finally the demands and wishes and buying motives, the salesperson, if it's consciously or unconsciously, uses this information to offer the personalized experience and the targeted consultation. So um, what do I need to buy today? Um, some advice here, all this information and all these consultation, what we see here. That we have to transfer now to the IoT. So um, basically, the, to, we need to transfer the personalized experience to the present. So in which more and more devices um, become part of the user's identity, and even more important, also interact on behalf of the user. So we see completely different requirements and needs should be considered here. So in the first step, we'll take a look now at the technical aspects in IoT. So you already have seen the question. So who is accessing, who is authorized, or how is someone authorized to perform certain actions on an IoT device? And basically, the technical questions are often related to security. So network security, authentication, encryption, what we see here, and with today's capabilities, also security analytics. So um, especially in real time, um, consider these um, inputs and directly react to it. As for example, John mentioned with the fraud detection, which we will see later. And also important is the API security. So um, in the context of CM, the access management. Um, but probably more important and more interesting in regard to the business opportunities is if we have a look at the business perspective. So the use cases which become more and more complex in the um, Internet of Things. So Let's um, take a refrigerator to be in the context of the shopping um, use case. Um, refrigerator ordering the food, um, which has certain factors influencing the process and the um, device itself. So basically in the beginning, it's quite easy. So who's paying for the food? It's quite interesting for sure. And who will take food from the refrigerator? So it's not only the person 
who bought the food, but also um, if you consider families, um, the number of people accessing or taking food up out of the refrigerator will increase um, immediately. What we also should take in the, into the context of use, um, there will be often a daily routine. So I'll get up at seven, make my breakfast, and then I go to work in the evening at six, I come back and start cooking. Um, but despite this daily routine, we have special events like cooking um, with friends, I have a holiday, and um, I have business trips, so um, which all need to be taken into account here. And it will get even more complex if we take into account the preferences and limitations here. So change of eating behavior that can be due to seasons, so summer and winter, it can be due to a DC or lifestyle trends like vegan, vegetarian, fruitarian. So many things need to be considered to um, help the refrigerator here. So that all influences what the device needs to order or even better, what the service provider um, needs to recommend, advise or deliver. So finally, it's not the device solely, it's also the service provider offering all these services here. As already pointed out in the beginning, I'm already using multiple devices, so I don't need to list them here, I think. But um, the number of devices will heavily increase in the near future, as indicated or forecasted by many analysts and studies here. So the number will explode due to everything will be a device and connected in the future. Moreover, we will not only have multiple devices or different devices, but we also will have them everywhere and at any time. Um, it is with a smartphone as we have today, so the world will become more and more connected. Um, many devices will also be shared devices, so where multiple users use not only one device, they will use one or more devices together. So coming back to our refrigerator example, um, it's not only the person buying the food, it's also his family. Or if we consider a car, I drive with the car of my dad, my mother drives with it, and so we have a bunch of people driving the car. All this causes an increasing security lag, um, especially considering the use cases arising. But we need to take care of that. Why do we need to take care of that? It's quite easy. Um, the customer expectation will increase with the technical opportunities. So if we know who is using the car, who is using um, or where is it, where, where it is used, which device is used. Um, all this should be taken into account. So more information finally will enable um, the businesses to deliver more benefit to the customer. If you take automated um, maintenance in the first example, it can be with a, with a car, but it can be also with industry machines. So finally the automated maintenance can take care of himself. It recognizes all that it can take actions on behalf of a company or in, on behalf of a person here. The same we see with cars. So we have navigation um, parking slots, cheap fuel, traffic information. All that can be taken into account, um, identified who, which user is, is um, driving the car. We can suggest the best gas station on the way. And we know um, we can even use um, cashless payments or enable cashless payments. Um, if we take the healthcare use cases, we um, see the same. So diagnosis um, becoming more automated. We have personalized and predictive medicine here. Um, if you take Apple Watch, for example, or Android watches to, um, to record sport activities or the complete health situation. The smart home environment, we already mentioned with a refrigerator, but also the same for the heating or windows or lights will appear here. Um, E-commerce is probably the most known example um, with the recommendations perfectly fitting so to our personal needs and wishes, buying motives here. Um, we have seen a lot about IoT now. Um, to make even more clear that a new area already started, let's have also a look at big data and why it is important to process the data in CM today with big data um, with big data solutions. Um, let's take a look at the CDAS um, lock-in events. So during a CDAS lock-in, many tasks need to be fulfilled in parallel 
end in real time. So starting from a fraud detection, maybe in less than 500 milliseconds, we have to check for consent if it's already given or if we need to check for consent here. We need to check for progressive profiling or progressive registration as um, John already pointed out, so that a user step-by-step -step um, provides the necessary information to these applications. Um, we will have the strong authentication. Um, John already pointed out with PSD2, there is a need, also in the healthcare sector, there is a need by law that certain information are secure. And also, even more important, um, password authentication or multi-factor features here with biometrics. So we have a complete bunch of parallel tasks which needs to be fulfilled not only for one person, but as indicated by John, by millions or billions of people um, over the time. So um, these, these tasks need to be processed in real time and parallel because login shall not take seconds, but milliseconds. And that's probably a good start um, to introduce the importance of why artificial intelligence, machine learning, and big data should be used in CM. So final statement here I would say is huge amount of data needs to be processed in real time for convenient, secure, and feature-rich CM. That is why we built CDAS on a modern um, microservice architecture in which big data concepts are an integral part of the platform. So if you take a look at the architecture what we provide in our virtualization layer based on Apache Mesos and Docker, um, it's perfect to operate big data technologies and to orchestrate containers. We have a processing layer with a bunch of big data technologies on top microservices with JavaScript and or TypeScript and Node.js and on the top layer SDKs. But it's not so important what technologies we are showing here. It's more important that we continuously evaluate um, these technologies or new technologies to use the best and most suitable technologies to operate CDAS. And based on our um, based on our architecture, we are also able to offer um, all our APIs um, to our customers. So finally, we follow the everything as is an API concept here. And I think it's quite it's a good start to show which use cases we already saw with these architecture stack and what big data and IoT concepts we um, apply currently in CDAS. So what use case and features do we provide with our modern architecture stack? Um, one of the most attractive features, um, which John already also indicated, the know your customer concept. Um, what we do here is a behavior-based clustering. Mm, the clustering based on channels, which is shown in this illustration, is only for the purpose of indicating the concept. So, Obviously, we do much more than only channels. We do devices, frequency, location, APIs, factors, and many, many more. So finally, it's about all of it. So a real behavior-based clustering to identify the behavior of a user. And most important, to derive the marketing insights about it to help the company, especially with an interactive dashboard, and trigger the business software in real time so that it can react according to the currently appearing event. To come back to easy illustrations as shown here, um, a significant change in our user behavior is a sw switch from an Apple enthusiast with only Apple devices to an Android device. So as mentioned, it's an easy example, but it indicates what is happening here with the automatic triggering of the business software. Um, if we take the behavior-based clustering, we do not only apply the it for the marketing automation, but also for the fraud detection. So it's a core of our modern proof of fraud detection. And the CDAS fraud detection recognizes any suspicious behavior and can trigger certain actions. So easy example is administrative, administrative actions like triggering a webhook or comparable actions to inform the software or monitoring um, suits. But more interesting is, as shown here, the smart multi-factor. So in addition to our advanced menu, um, multi-factor features, including biometrics, mobile biometrics, and basic options like smart push, SMS, and many more, the smart MFA is triggered in real time. So by the CDAS FDS and ask the user to confirm the identity 
by a second factor. So if we um, recognize any suspicious behavior, we say, okay, please user, um, show me that it's you by using your face ID, by using CC does face recognition, a smart push behavior, anything like this. Important here, we provide all of our features in the Fidas Authenticator app, but even better, um, we offer it as an SDK. So our clients can integrate all these features easily into their own apps. Um, to give a short background about um, the modern feature-rich product, what we built here, um, it's built with 20 years of experience in big data and IoT, so um, to meet the business needs of our clients. Um, as mentioned, we refer to a long-term experience in diverse projects, including fraud detection, marketing automation with, for example, shopping cart abundant projects. Um, we are with Vida's concepts in the area of custom development and IT consulting for many clients here. And what we recognized over the time with all, in all of these projects is that identity and access management is an important challenge in companies, especially nowadays with IoT and also internet is taken as granted. So as already mentioned, the customer or user expectation is increasing with the techn technical opportunities. So one of these expectations is um, a good user comfort or also that identity linking or user deduplication is happening. So basically users want to have easy access to application and businesses on the other side do not want to have many duplicates in their user data. Same applies for the user. So a user will suffer from a bad user experience if he or she accidentally created a second user account. So what is the idea behind our um, identity linking and user deduplication? If a user registers with a Facebook account and three months later come, comes back and remembers, hey, I used the social login, but now uses Google instead of Facebook or any other identity provider, he do not want to create a new account. Um, to overcome this, we um, recognize the duplicate account and offer him to link the identities. So finally, it is one user with multiple identities and multiple options to log into his account. And CDAS takes care of um, takes care of all of this. And we now have seen a lot of um, big data driven features, I would say. Um, now we would like to bring in IoT or Internet of Things a little bit more. So a starting point for our IoT suite, we thought about um, extending our feature set by using already existing features to create and facilitate new use cases as with the physical authentication. Hereby we use our MFA options, especially the biometric features to secure physical entrances. Use cases are diverse and numerous, I would say. Um, to give a short example here, I would say a training center um, can offer its customers to book an event in the online shop and also offer them a self service um, to register the physical authentication by themselves. Thereby they, they secure their training center and at the same time allow easy access for the participants at a certain point of time. So when the course will happen. That cannot only happen via face recognition. There are many techniques which can be used here. To see another feature of our, of our, of our IoT suite here, um, which is aiming at the same target, um, it's the real world identification. So hereby we use certain technologies like geofencing, um, beacons or Bluetooth to identify users um, of our clients in the real world. So we can link the real world identity with the digital identity the user already has and deliver thereby an even better user experience, I would say. Um, in this context, also many use cases arise. Take, we take a fashion shop, providing the user the best experience in the online shop and local store, and providing them the best recommendation in both worlds if they um, identify when the user is visit, visiting the local store and when he's visiting the online shop, figuring out which devices he's using as well as what he wants to buy. 
we can also take a supermarket um, where effortless and cashless payment um, can be enabled due to one of the most important tasks here is to identify the user is already solved with this. And that's also what we believe in. If you show the benefit to the user and make it transparent for what reason or purpose um, you're using these different data and information or you're applying certain technologies and many users will give their consent. Um, you can use, as John mentioned, um, consent management, it's important. We also have a built-in consent management solution here, um, really advanced one, a detailed one, and um, just show it to the user and make transparent what you're using it for. In the start, as always, innovators and early adopters will start, but soon a majority will follow. That's what we believe in. Taking a look at the um, roadmap to go, um, as you or as we have seen, we achieved already a lot, um, but there's much more to come, as always. So, especially if you bring together the requirements we have seen in John's presentation and our presentation, and the innovations shown um, and features and requirements which are coming, and we see already a lot of matches here with our system, which we are proud of. Um, but we always strive for more. So the next, what we are working on is um, we take a look on, on the graph and the IoT device authority management and for sure improve our real world identification. That will give a big boost to our clients to bring together real world and identity and digital identity. And important to point out here is that it's always a combination of security and real time custom engagement. So we always target for security, but it's also really important to consider the customer engagement because that's one of the main sources of success for our clients, independent of which sector or area they are active. If we take a look at the IoT device authority management, which we, um, which I mentioned just now, um, we call it internally CDAS IoT and um, coming back to our use case at the beginning, the refrigerator, um, there's much more. It's not only smart home setup. So in the same sense, we see high demands for IoT device authority management in manufacturing and production lines. So starting from which users are allowed to do, a, to do certain actions or commands on a machine. For example, production engineers or maintenance, maintenance engineers, they both have different roles, perform different actions, um, on the machine um, to uh, even more automated process so to a completely automated production line where there will be a huge amount of different IoT devices with different authorities in it. Now we've seen quite a lot. I would like to summarize um, CEDAS a little bit in that aspect and um, especially in three aspects starting with, with the security and um, we, as pointed out, we apply big data fraud detection here um, with a comprehensive set of multi-factors, including biometric methods. We have a second aspect, which is really important, which is um, the analytics part with Know Your Customer, also based on the user profiling with big data. Um, basically, an advanced digital consent management, which is really important to get the consent to be compliant with the law, but also to be transparent and show the user what you're doing um, what we didn't have a um, what we didn't show today is the group management so the um, combination of b2b and b2c so finally a customer identity and access management so um, that's quite important if you consider for example families it's not as mentioned not always one customer it's often that you have more than one customer more than one consumer here families companies many things um, hereby, we also put in our the linking of the virtual and the real world identity of person, because that's a quite important source of data which you can utilize um, in the analytics here to deliver a much better experience for the customer. And third, the technical aspect, um, John already pointed out a little bit, um, things will change here. So we have microservices architecture, um, as already mentioned, we offer everything as an API. So all the services we provide can be used and can be addressed via an API. 
Um, cloud services as 24 hours, seven days a week is obviously if the login goes down or registration goes down, no one will be happy anymore. And based on our microservice architecture, we are able to scale the application and fit it to the um, needs of the customer immediately. So in seconds, I would say, which is a huge, huge advantage of our architecture here, especially um, based on the um, Apache Mesos and Docker um, underlying infrastructure here, I would say. Coming to the end, I would first like to thank um, John for the great presentation. In the beginning, again, was quite interesting to see it. Um, would, I would like to thank Kubinga Cole here and all my colleagues for sure. Um, John already pointed out we are sponsor at the Consumer Identity World in Europe in Amsterdam, end of October, and in the Consumer Identity World in Apex, so in Singapore, end of November. And in both, we will have a booth as a sponsor and we will have a speaker slot. Um, I myself will be available in Amsterdam um, in the speaker slot, so I will talk about biometric login and I'm really happy to, to see you there. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now or get in touch with us. We are really happy to answer all them and to show you what CDAS can offer you. Thanks. Great, well, thank you. Thank you, Cedric. So feel free to all attendees to go ahead and put some questions in the blank. I see a couple coming in right now. Let's see. Cedric, can you please explain a bit more about the process used for linking accounts? Sure. Um, so basically the, the process of linking accounts um, is quite easy. So it, we, have, we have two processes here. So it can be triggered by our user deduplication. So we recognize a user already exists and we offer the user, okay, please log into your already existing account and link to both accounts or create a new account if you want to, or it can be triggered by the user itself. So the user can in his self-service portal say, okay, I now use Facebook and um, I want to use Facebook, um, Google in the future or also create a client account and um, then you can link them here or if they're already existing two accounts we will merge them to one account great another question is do you see CIAM merging with IAM um, I'll, I'll I'll take a shot at that and then you can have a turn to Cedric sure. I, I think the answer to that is yes I think uh, in many cases, you know, we initially saw some differentiation between uh, traditional or enterprise IAM and consumer-facing IAM. But as enterprise IAM solutions start moving in that direction, they've had to modernize their products and service offerings. Increasingly, we see these kinds of things offered as a service. So, you know, identity as a service. Um, which makes it much easier to customize or do both employee facing and customer facing uh, identity management solutions. So just from the sake of reducing complexity, I think many businesses will start to merge their IAM and CIM uh, just because you know it's difficult to, run two different systems. It increases the administrative cost, it probably increases the infrastructure cost, even if you're doing something cloud-based. So yes, I would say over the next few years, you'll probably see uh, trends, at least in some areas, where IAM and CIM are going to get closer and closer to one another. What do you think, Cedric? I, I agree with you. Um, you brought up um, a lot of points already, and um, I would add one more. If you take a look at many of these applications, the interaction with the customer becomes more and more important. And for sure, it's much easier if you um, secure the application with only one system, so with a CM system, for example, and bring your customers on board and bring your employees on board in that aspect. So it's it's really, um, it's a logical process that um, both systems getting close to each other and, and Finally, one, the CM will probably 
and stand here and fulfill the tasks. Okay. Yeah, there are a few more questions here. What was the starting point of your approach with IoT and CDAS? Um, I um, as mentioned often in the presentation, in or sometimes in the presentation, I would say um, we um, from Vidas Concepts have or do since 20, more than 20 years um, different custom development projects, different software projects. We have seen quite a lot here. And we have also have many um, IoT projects. Already today, we have many devices, as mentioned, and the number will rapidly increase in the future. So we have seen the needs, and especially the first statement, so the um, IoT devices eroding the identity of the user, um, putting the pressure here that in the future, um, we really need to take into account the devices. So basically, based um, or coming from our projects, that was the starting point that we say, okay, IoT will be one of the next big things we need to consider. Okay. And do you think biometrics will make traditional authentication procedures obsolete? Or what makes biometrics a real must-have function in CIAM? Um, yes, we think that biometric login um, will become more and more important and step by step it will be used much more. Um, we do see, see that it works best. So if customers provide multiple biometric options depending on their preference and also depending on what works best for them um, or what works best for the use case, it really works in a good way. And one advantage what biometrics brings um, is we always have it with us. Username, password, we have to remember, we have to renew it, we have to change it over some time. Biometrics is thereby an effective and secure way. And um, we already see that, or already see that um, many users are already familiar with it. So we have it in Touch ID, or you pointed out Samsung, so the Android fingerprint systems, and we already have them, users apply them and use them heavily. Also, um, the face recognition, so face ID of, of Apple or other systems like the Honor, we all see there that um, the users start to use these technologies and prefer them because they're more comfortable and faster. That's why I think, or that's why we think the biometric login will become more and more important and it's a must have. You know, I, I would agree with that. Um, I think that there, there are definitely ease of use in many cases, you know, touch ID, face ID, customers, consumers want to not have to remember lots of usernames and passwords, um, you know, and there are security issues that that solves. But there are some also some problems around biometrics. There are operational concerns. I mean, there are certain populations that aren't necessarily well served by touch ID and face ID you can, you know, be susceptible to things like you know, daily changes, you know, did you shave today or did you not shave today? You know, so it can, there's a way to go with making biometrics as operationally uh, good as they can be. But, but yeah, I do see the same thing that people are very interested in getting away from passwords and doing something that's uh, useful and convenient. And I think biometrics has a lot of promise in that area, but it's, uh, it's not perfect. Uh, there's always a balance uh, between usability and security. So uh, it'll be interesting to watch. There's been so much development in that particular field already, biometric authentication, and I think it remains a, a hotbed for R&D for authentication. Yeah, I agree. So we have another one. Where, where do services, where do CDES services what geographies, I guess, what areas do you service with uh, CDAS? So basically, due to CDAS is a cloud service. It's available all over the world. Um, but in regard to our marketing activities, um, due to our headquarters is based in Germany, and we started in Germany and served for the um, German, Austrian, Switzerland market in the beginning and quickly expand heavily in the European market. But we also started um, in the Asian market. That's also why we attend in Singapore at the conference and um, 
frankly spoken, we are open to all markets. Um, that's due to be in the beginning of the marketing phase. That's our starting point in Europe and Asia. Okay. Let's see. Do you see CDES more as an identity provider or more as a profile management environment? Um, we see it more as an identity provider. So um, sure, we integrate um, other identity providers into CDES um, to offer um, a huge um, amount of login possibilities to customers or to users. Um, but CDES is, um, due to its feature set, um, the advanced multi-factor options, the, the profile options, what we did over here, all the login capabilities, what we, and registration capabilities, what we offer, um, the um, basis with OpenID Connect and OS2, also the OS2 device flow. Um, we are um, an identity provider um, with an advanced set of features um, necessary in the in the area of identity management and personalized or customer experience, I would say. Okay. We probably have time for one more question here. What features are your customers asking for in the product? Um, currently, we see a huge demand for strong and biometric authentication. Um, that is probably driven by laws. Um, as you pointed already out, the PSD2 for financial institutes or patient laws in the healthcare sector. Um, in that aspect, also customer, customers appreciate the smart MFA feature with the CDAS fraud detection, what we offer here. Um, but also passwordless authentication becomes quite of interesting. It's currently not a must have, but it's something which um, they have a look at. Um, especially um, also constant management in regard to GDPR or in Europe um, or other data privacy regulations in other parts of the world. It's becoming more and more important to be transparent and to get the consent of the user. Um, I think particular our big data and artificial intelligence capabilities are regressed a lot. Um, and I'm curious to see how fast the IoT will affect the client use cases and also our feature set here. Well, great. Thank you, Cedric. We're at the top of the hour. And thank you to everyone who's dialed in today. Uh, this will be available on the website tomorrow, uh, the recording. And we look forward to doing future webinars and check out the events that you see on the screen here. And with that, we will conclude today's webinar. Thanks again, Cedric. Thanks.